Howdy folks, it's me, Josh. The year is 1815, and for decades, Europe had been racked by the destruction caused by the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. But in 1812, Napoleon faced a disastrous defeat with his attempted invasion of Russia, which led to the near-complete destruction of the French army as the coalition began to go on the offensive. And, after a couple more years of war, the coalition managed to work together to defeat Napoleon. But, right when the coalition was closing in on Paris, Tsar Alexander of Russia, who was leading the Russian army, abandoned the coalition, making a break for Paris, taking the city himself, personally negotiating with, and accepting Napoleon's surrender. And so, for these reasons, as well as Napoleon's defeat in Russia being the instigator for his defeat, Tsar Alexander saw himself and Russia as personally responsible for Napoleon's defeat. See, Tsar Alexander was very sporadic and random in his self-image and behavior sometimes. For instance, at one moment, he might see himself as the ultimate enemy of the French and the bane of Napoleon, the one who finally defeated the scourge of Europe, and at another, he'd see himself as an honorable diplomat willing to cooperate and work with Napoleon as an equal. Now, despite the obvious contradictions, this was just how his mind worked. And this randomness would often seep into his actions, which would become very apparent in the following negotiations, as Alexander essentially acted as a wild card. After Napoleon's defeat, the great powers of Europe, being Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, began drawing up plans for what to do next and how to keep the continent from exploding again. And the first order of business was, what the heck do we do with France? Britain, Austria, and Prussia all agreed that the Bourbon monarchy, which was overthrown during the French Revolution, should be restored. But Alexander, of course was not having it. Throughout its history, Russia had always had a vested interest in expansion into Central Europe and towards the Black Sea, primarily as a way to gain more valuable land, warm water ports, and to keep the Russian heartland from being too vulnerable to invasion. However, the Bourbon monarchy had traditionally aligned itself with Russia's arch enemies in those regions, namely Poland and the Ottoman Empire. So, Alexander was vehemently against the proposition of a Bourbon restoration, pushing back against it at every turn before ultimately being forced to yield, allowing for the restoration of Louis XVIII, Louis XVI's younger brother, to the French throne. And, with the restoration of Louis XVIII, the rest of the great powers of Europe felt comfortable with allowing France a seat at the table in negotiations. And so, the stage was set, and the five great powers would end up meeting in Vienna to determine the future of Europe through what became known as the Congress of Vienna. Going into the Congress, Russia's one main goal was to take Poland. All of it. A couple decades prior, after the decline of the centuries-old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Poland's neighbors, Prussia, Austria, and Russia, agreed to a series of partitions of Poland, known as the, uh, partitions of Poland, dividing the territory amongst themselves. The Poles, though, obviously weren't super thrilled about not having a country anymore, so when Napoleon began conquering Europe, the Poles were quick to align themselves with Napoleon, securing the creation of the small Duchy of Warsaw from Prussia's Polish territory. However, after Napoleon's defeat, Alexander, who, again, saw himself as the sole victor of the war, saw fit to take all of Poland as a trophy for Russia's victory, which, of course, the other great powers weren't all that thrilled about. For Britain and Austria, this would mean that Russia would end up way too powerful in Europe and threaten the balance of power. For Prussia, this meant that they would have to give up the land that they had acquired in Poland, leaving them vulnerable. And for France, this meant that their traditional ally would be wiped off the face of the earth. So, the great powers were all united. Against Russia. Discussions between Russia and the rest of the powers got heated as Alexander refused to back down from his claims. Things got so heated, in fact, that during negotiations, 
Alexander even threatened to murder the king of Saxony to keep Prussia from pressing claims in Poland. Yeah. Needless to say, things were getting tense and fast as Europe began preparing for war once again. But after intense discussions, Alexander eventually relented and agreed to allow for a semi-independent Poland, with himself as king, and some land in the west being given to Prussia as they also gained lands in Saxony and the Rhine as compensation. And so, with the crisis averted, Europe entered a great period of relative stability for the next hundred years. But what if that changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, Tsar Alexander refused to back down in his claims to Poland and Europe went to war again? Russia, who had already had an immense amount of troops there, would immediately fortify their positions as they begin to send troops out to occupy East Prussia and Austrian Galicia. However, despite this initial success, the Russians are quickly halted by coalition forces being forced out of Austria and Prussia. But once the Russians are forced out, the coalition now faces the task of trying to force Russia out of the heavily fortified Poland, which they would know would be difficult. And so, instead of charging in head on, the coalition comes up with a plan. During negotiations, the idea of an independent Poland saw widespread support, except from Russia. And in the event of a war with Russia, Clemens von Metternich, the Austrian foreign minister, had stated that the coalition could name a king of an independent Poland and launch the entire territory into rebellion. And so, the coalition very likely follows through with this, naming a new king of Poland as the country breaks out into revolt against the Russians. So, now not only facing the assault from the coalition, the Russians now also have to face rebellion from the Poles, which greatly diminishes their ability to defend the region. And so, seeing that they couldn't win this fight, the Russians withdraw as the coalition seizes a decisive victory. Following their victory, the coalition follows through on their promise of an independent Poland, wanting to create a buffer state that would halt Russian expansion into Central Europe, while Prussia gains all of their claimed land in Poland, plus still gaining lands from Saxony. But an independent Poland wouldn't come without its problems. Over the past several centuries, but greatly after the French Revolution, Poland had become a bastion of liberalism squashed between the conservative monarchist powers of Prussia, Austria, and Russia. So when it comes to selecting the Polish king, Prussia and Austria, fearing the spread of liberalism into their own territories, make sure to name a conservative member of the Polish aristocracy, which keeps the liberal Poles at bay, at least for now, as Poland, Prussia, and Austria enter into a close alliance to deter any further Russian expansion. Meanwhile, in Russia, as Alexander comes home not only without Poland, but also potentially losing territory, the aristocracy, who had already shown such sentiments in our timeline if this were to happen, might end up staging a coup, forcing Alexander to give up great amounts of power to the aristocracy. And the aristocracy in Russia would very likely take a harsh stance against the revived Poland, pushing for further westward expansion, likely ending up resulting in another Russian invasion of Poland. But with Austrian and Prussian protection, it's very likely that the Russians would be defeated once again. A few decades pass, and once again, in the year 1848, Europe explodes in revolt. And, in Poland, the conservative king is possibly overthrown as a more liberal regime takes control over the country. And, in the nationalistic spirit of the revolutions, Poland likely begins seeking reunification with all Polish-speaking people. And, in Prussia, this likely leads to a Polish revolt breaking out, as Poland declares war on Prussia, starting a Polish-Prussian war over Prussia's Polish territories. Gonna say that five times fast. Meanwhile, seeing an opportunity, Russia joins the war on Prussia's behalf, launching another invasion into Poland. And, facing war against these two great powers, Poland is easily defeated as Prussia and Russia, seeing Polish liberalism as a mutual threat, agree to yet another partition of Poland. 
The liberal Western powers of Britain and France greatly protest against the seeming land grab by Prussia and Russia, demanding independence for Poland, as some even begin calling for war. However, these threats only drive Prussia and Russia closer together, as the two form a close partnership. A few years later, upon the outbreak of the Crimean War, which saw Russia fighting against Britain and France, it's very possible that, in this timeline, Prussia ends up joining the war on the Russian side, wanting to curb Western influence. And Austria, meanwhile, still seeing Russian dominance over the Balkans as a threat, decides to stay neutral, once again souring Russian relations with Austria. In the end, with Prussia able to support Russian lines, and as Prussian artillery keeps the Western Allies from being able to form a beachhead, Russia and Prussia manage to win the war. As a result of this victory, Russia secures its dominance over the Balkans, taking a great amount of territory, including Constantinople, as Russia now begins to project its influence across the globe. And, without the backlash against his leadership that came after the war in our timeline, Tsar Alexander II isn't assassinated and manages to continue his reforms as Russia pushes towards modernization. Meanwhile, as Austria continues to find itself isolated and declining, Prussia once again seeks domination over Germany, unifying the country as Italy unites itself as well. But, with Russian dominance over the Balkans, Austria is ultimately left at the mercy of the Prussians, or er, Germans now, and the Russians. So, seeking their own survival, as well as to align itself with fellow conservative monarchies, Austria ultimately joins the fold as a junior partner, and Europe begins to divide into two camps, the liberal Western powers and the conservative Eastern powers. And so, as the once victorious great powers find themselves breaking down into their own factions, Europe begins to gear up for its next great war. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to stick around for more. And hey, you could also maybe subscribe or something. So that's it for today's video. Well, till next time, see ya.